So this chapter focuses on immunological disorders. So within it, um, we're going to talk about hypersensitivities, and that's what we're going to focus on today because there's four different ones. So hyper means a lot of, right? Um, and you're sensitive to it. You're responding to it. And so just as I said, this is almost going to be like a review of what we've gone over before. Um, it's, a, it's the normal immunological response. The problem is it's an over-response to things that we don't necessarily need to be responding to, right? So we'll look at each one of those. Autoimmune, the name itself kind of lets you know what it is, right? Auto means self, immune. This is where the immune system is attacking <coughs> yourself, right? And again, this isn't something normal, right? This is an unfortunate thing that sometimes happens. And then immunodeficiency, where the immune system is deficient, right? It's not working properly. And there's lots of different reasons why that could potentially happen, right? So one of your classmates last time was asking me about SCIDS, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. And remember I said to him, basically, that's the bubble boy. And he's like, yeah, I have a friend who has a child who's, you know, um, has to be sequestered because of the level that they were born with of dysfunction of their immune system is so extreme, right? And that's one of the things we're going to talk about on Friday, right? Today we're probably just going to focus on the hypersensitivities. So they're numbered, but I'm not ever going to just put the number for you guys. I will write out the whole title, which, I'll, which is a big clue <laughs> as to what's going on. So for type 1, it's commonly referred to as um, IgE mediated, right? And for homework, I had wanted you guys to watch some of these animations. I'm not going to play through them. Um, I'll probably use it and do my own audio associated with it, but I wanted you guys to listen to it. Um, so we're going to go through what, what are the reactions that happen in this type of hypersensitivity, right? Each of the steps. And then we're also going to, to give four examples of different types of type 1 hypersensitivities. Right, so IgE, so this one is immediate IgA mediated, right? It, it, it happens because of the antibodies of the E class, IgE. And this reaction can happen immediately, I kid you not, within seconds. For someone who's been sensitized, and in this case it means that they've been exposed once at least right, that this process that we talked about before happened, that you produced memory cells, right, and so the process when it happens again, it's faster. The tendency to have, um, unfortunately, these type of hypersensitivities, what we commonly refer to as allergy, um, is inherited, right, this programming of your body to produce IgEs under these certain sets of circumstances. Um, is inherited. So, you know, I have my mom to blame for my allergies. My son has me to blame for his. And, you know, if it continues down the line. Uh, so, 20 to 30 percent, and I would say it's probably even higher nowadays, right? Because, again, it's genetic. And now that people don't die from some of the allergies anymore, we continue to pass it on, right? So, it predominates within the population because it's no longer necessarily lethal. There's different types. There's local anaphylaxis, so this is what one of the names given to that type of response, that inflammatory response. So what I experience, what's commonly referred to as hay fever, right, where my nose becomes stuffy, eyes runny and itchy, that's localized. Generalized anaphylaxis is, is, is like an example of when people have food allergies and it goes into their bloodstream and you have widespread inflammation right, an immune response. And that generally can be lethal if not attended to. So anaphylaxis says commonly another name that's used for IgE mediated allergic reactions. So how does all of this happen? Well, the IgE, that class of antibody is responsible. The first thing that needs to happen though is that that antigen, or what we sometimes call the allergen in this case, right, our body is exposed to it the very first time, an antigen presenting cell. And give me some examples of antigen presenting cells, names specifically. What could this be? 
what white type of white blood cell could this be? It could be a B cell, right? It's not though. What's another choice? An antigen presenting cell. It's going to take it in. Look at y'all. It's going to engulf it, right? Break it down. Who does stuff like this? Macrophages, right? Which are derived from what cells in your blood? Oh, Monday's going to be rough. Monocytes, right? What's the ones that do this next part a lot, which is presenting the antigen? They're your scouts. They're all over the place. And they are running back to the lymphoid organs with the information. They have long, yeah, dendritic cells, right? So this is probably a macrophage or a dendritic cell, right? And MHC class two, they'll present, right? And they're going to talk to the helper T cell, which has CD four. That's what this part is right here. And we wind up before it becomes really bright. There we go. So there's the CD4, there's the T cell receptor, right? So we know this is a helper T cell. What happens to this guy by communicating with this antigen presenting cell? This T cell becomes what? Goes from naive to being, it's recognizing this antigen that this antigen presenting cell is presenting. It becomes activated, right? And what's synonymous with activation? We're not going to have just one T cell that recognizes now they're going to proliferate and you're going to have lots of helper T cells that recognize this antigen. So then they could go and help out our next guy who's the B cell, right? Who's also come in contact with this antigen, who's also presenting it on his surface, right? And the helper T cell that's already been activated and recognizing it comes now and activates the B cell, right? And the B cell is going to do what? If it's activated, we're going to go from one B cell to a whole bunch of them that are the same, right? What we call clonal selection, it's been selected. We have a whole bunch of them. And then they're going to differentiate into two cell types. Which two? Plasma cells and memory cells. And what do the plasma cells do? They secrete antibodies, right? So we have those. And in this case, what class of antibody is it? IgE. IgE. Erica hates this one, remember? I really do. I'm not very fond of these E's because what do they do? Once this first time you become, and this is that sensitization process we talk about. So now you're sensitized because you have these IgEs. What cells does anybody know do they bind to? Mast cells, which are similar to who? Which one of the fills? Which one of the granulocytes? Basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil, they're similar to basophils, right? The granules are similar. The difference is mast cells are in your tissues, right? So in my case, in my nose, right? Associated the mucous membranes in my nose. So these antibodies stick on here and they can stay here for weeks at a time. So once you become sensitized, each time remember that your B cell gets activated, it produces memory cells. Plasma cells secretes this antibody. This particular antibody then goes and attaches to these mast cells. So then you inhale it again, right? The second time or the third time. What happens is these mast cells are already coated in this antibody. When they bind to two of the antibodies on the surface of the mast cell, this mast cell degranulates, releases things like histamine which is why people who experience allergy take antihistamine drugs to block the action of histamine. Because what does histamine do? Well, it depends on where it's being released, right? And there are other mediators. That's just one of the major players is histamine, right? We're most familiar with that one. It can cause capillary dilation, right? Because think about this. This is usually the normal immune response inflammation, right? Capillaries dilate, white blood cells come to the area to destroy the invaders. The problem is, is that me this may have been a pollen granule. Is that going to grow and cause damage to your body, in your body? No. No. Peanut? No. <laughs> right? These are not things that are pathogenic, but they are foreign to your body. And your body recognizes and unfortunately goes this path. If inhaled into the lungs, it can cause airway constriction by 
starting this cascade, right, having these mediators released, increase mucus secretion. Again, it's a normal immunological response, right? You want to try and trap the pathogens and move them where you want them to go, not getting into your body, right, completely in. Um, this, of course, the pain is associated again with that inflammatory type response, and then also sometimes you experience itching, right? So schematically, right, the very first time sets us up for producing these antibodies, right, and more memory cells so that each time we're exposed, right, we're going to produce even more antibodies. And once those antibodies are produced and you get exposed again, they're already on the mast cells. So that reaction time is literally within seconds sometimes, right, of that allergen crossing getting in to the tissues, interacting with these antibodies on the surface of that mast cell, it degranulating and releasing things like histamine. So the very first time you're exposed, you don't get this, this reaction per se, right? You become sensitized though. And then each time this same process is going to happen, so you get even more antibodies produced, and you already have antibodies on those mast cells so you get all those common um, symptoms that we, we uh, uh, equate to allergy or what's referred to as immediate IgE mediated, right? It is because of IgE. So in the skin, you'll see a reaction like you see here, right? That's commonly referred to as hives, right? You have what's called the wheel and flare, right? So the redness is the flare, the wheel is the puffiness. Again, this is just inflammation in your skin, right? That's what's going on, right? We're setting out pro-inflammatory pro um, mediators from those mast cells that are coated in IgE and are being stimulated. So this picture is actually a picture of someone going through allergy testing. Notice the little um, lines on the arm? That's so they can keep track of what allergen they put where. And I can tell you I've been through this. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> because I was extremely allergic to um, thistle. When they did this test, the inflammation was so great, um, it was on this particular arm, and I couldn't wear my watch for quite a while because of how swollen it was. And I had to take steroids after my, uh, anab after my testing um, to um, bring the swelling down, okay? I was that allergic to that particular one. Um, and, and ragweed was pretty bad, <laughs> um, and a couple of others. Um, and then they had done all the pet stuff on my other arm. At the time, I, I still wanted to be a veterinarian. So I was telling this arm, my right arm, if it puffed up, I was going to cut it off. Because <laughs> there's no way I could be allergic to animals, right? That would ruin my life. Um, but the good news is I wasn't allergic to any animals, wasn't allergic to any foods. Just, just about any grass out there and weeds um, are my nightmare. Um, <laughs> they make it very difficult to breathe. And that's what we commonly refer to as hay fever, right? Where people have trouble with the breathing through the nose um, and it can affect the eyes even for some people. Um, because again, those allergens are getting in those areas um, in your body, you're breathing them in. Asthma is a little bit different in that it's actually a reaction is happening in the lungs or in the bronchioles leading to the lungs. Um, and this is a different set of, of um, mediators. The, the cells in that area, the mast cells, re release different things other than histamine, which is why people who experience asthma can't take antihistamines. That's not going to help them. That's why they take different types of drugs, where for people who experience hay fever like myself, antihistamines can be beneficial because that's one of the main mediators released by mast cells in that area of our body, all right, our nasal passages. Um, and uh, for hives, too, it could be a contact thing where you came in contact with something. But a lot of times people can also get hives from foods that they eat. Um, shellfish, yeah. Breathe, right, yeah. So think about this. When you eat, right, so what she said is her brother's allergic to shellfish. Um, and he also has asthma. 
um, and probably is, a, is allergic to the shellfish twofold, right? Where he'll have uh, a reaction that could happen in his lungs because when you eat little bits you inhale, believe it or not, um, into your lungs, right? And so then you could have the reaction in the lungs. And the bad news with food allergies is that that allergen, you know, goes into your bloodstream, right? The food you eat goes into your bloodstream to feed your body. Um, and so people who have food allergies sometimes will also have a skin reaction of hives and a lot of times it'll show on the abdomen region first because again that's the first part of your body that receives that blood from your intestines right and then it can spread you know whole body wise for some people um, so hives can be twofold it can be contact and but also it can be when you ingest something um, because it travels through your blood make sense Okay, so and the bad news is when it travels through your blood, is you you could be experiencing general anaphylaxis. This is rare, although not so much nowadays, um, but more serious because this, they they've entered into your bloodstream, and so you can induce inflammation all throughout the body. And when this happens, you'll get a severe drop in blood pressure. We refer to this as shock, right? Numerous things can cause you to go into shock. What shock is is an extreme drop in blood pressure and so that you're not getting blood flow to your vital organs and you could die, okay? Um, if we know it's anaphylactic shock, we're gonna try and mediate that type of reaction. The most common thing the person who experiences this, and again, it's food allergies that could cause this, have the potential for this, because it's something you ingest and then goes into your bloodstream, right? And so it travels system-wide. Um, uh, but also some injected um, allergens um, like uh, bee venom. Um, some people are extremely allergic to um, even the ant venom that we have here, the lovely fire ants. Um, but bee and wasps, like I'm allergic to wasps, horrible. My whole foot swelled up before my first wedding. My mom was like screaming at me. She's like, why didn't you wear those shoes before the wedding like I told you to? I'm like, mom, I did. Last night I got bit by a wasp. My foot is swollen. <laughs> That's why I'm hobbling around in these shoes, <laughs> okay? I am swollen, okay? Uh, but it, my allergy, thankfully for that one, is, is not so severe that I have to travel out around an EpiPen. But sometimes when you get bit, it could enter into the bloodstream and it could travel system-wide. And that's why some people have food allergies or, you know, um, uh, allergic to bee stings and stuff like that because they're literally injecting it into you and there's a chance it could go into the bloodstream. Um, and because of that, they need that immediate relief of the vasodilation that happens to the blood vessels, it, that inflammation response from those mediators released by the mast cells. Um, and what the epinephrine does is it actually constricts the blood vessels, right, and speeds up the heart rate um, until you can get proper medical attention. Um, so it's, it's just meant to, to save your butt shortly, and, and then we have to deal with the rest later. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the purpose for, for that. Um, and that's the scary thing that can happen. And, and that's why, you know, um, people freak out about peanut butter in schools for kids who have peanut butter allergies. And it seems like nowadays that's all we talk about, right, is peanut butter allergies. And again, what did I say about allergies? They're inherited. So in the past, guess what happened to the parents of these people who have peanut allergies? They ate peanuts and they died. And they didn't have children. Nowadays, right, we know to test for these things, right? We know once it happens, because each time you get exposed, the, the response is even greater, right? So hopefully, the first time you experience the, the allergy, you get attention, you understand that it's a peanut allergy, and you stay away from it, right? And you prepare for it, right? So you're allowed to grow up and have kids who then you just passed on possibly genetically the peanut allergy make sense so that's a true scientific reason on why we see more of it than we have ever in the past because the people who have it have survived and passed it on same thing with my good old hay fever environment comes into play too so we're, we're going to just talk about um, I'm not going to talk about this second therapy, um, so you don't have to worry about that next slide, but we are going to talk about this, this first therapy. This is commonly employed 
um, technique for um, especially things like um, hay fever. I think they do might do it for ingested allergies too. Um, it's called desensitization. And what they do is like they did for me, is that they find out exactly what you're allergic to. And they make a special cocktail just for you of the allergens you're allergic to. And they inject it into you. Instead of you inhaling it like you normally do, we inject it in. So the hope is, is that your body switches to producing a different class of antibodies, IgGs. IgGs do not bind to the surface of mast cells in basophils, right? So they don't cause that reaction that we normally have, right? That inflammatory response by things like histamine. So if we can build up more IgGs in your system than IgEs, we can potentially block that reaction from happening, right? So what they do is they give you a series of shots of increasing dosage over time, right? into your tissue, into your skin, so that you produce IgGs instead of IgMs. And I'll tell you, I went through this therapy for about six months before I ended up having to move to another part of the country. And when, you, when you're in allergic state, you can't go through the therapy. So where I moved, I was like, it was always ragweed season. So I was always experiencing allergy. So even though I brought my special little cocktail with me, we never got it um, going again. But I can say thistle, I think that I'm not allergic to it anymore. So that just those six months of that cocktail that I had, um, I'm, I'm no longer allergic to um, thistle, which is good because that was one of the worst ones for me. Um, ragweed, not so much, though. And then they're developing, and I don't think they have it just yet because my doctor hasn't called me yet. <laughs> but um, they're trying to develop a pill so you could take it orally, right, and produce antibodies against it, IgGs or maybe even IgAs, against um, the different pollens in grasses. Because uh, grasses and weeds are the most common um, hay fever allergies that people experience. So you, instead of having to go into a doctor's office and get a shot, you could take a pill, right? and get desensitized that route, right, instead of inhaling this stuff. So another trick that has also been told to me, and um, a lot of people swear by it, and I just haven't worked it into my routine yet, um, is to actually eat a tablespoon of raw honey from the local area in which you live. Because again, there is pollen in that honey, you're taking it orally, so then you're going to produce IgGs or IgAs instead of IgE to it. So that hopefully over time you become what's called desensitized, right? No longer allergic to those pollens in our area. Make sense? All right. The next one is more complicated. Like I said, we're going to skip it. It's uh, relatively rare uh, immunotherapy. So that's it for IgE. Medi immediate, right? IgE mediated. This happens fast, right? Because those antibodies are already on the surface of the cells that are going to cause that reaction. Now we're going to look at type 2, which is commonly referred to as cytotoxic. So cyto, we're talking about cells, and toxic, we're going to be killing cells. So this was, is what happens because we do blood transfusions or as a phenomenon that happens with hemolytic disease of a newborn, okay? But the same set of things that we've talked about. First of all, you've got to have antibodies. This one's another one that involves antibodies, but it's two classes of antibodies. Antibodies, as we know, can interact with complement. Do you guys remember what two classes of antibodies can activate complement? Ig, I, IgM and IgG, right? The two main players, right? Both of those can activate complement. When we activate complement, what what happens? What happens? What are the outcomes of complement activation? Like I said, this is all review. You should know this already. What is C three A and C five A cause? There are cytokines that are chemotoxic to things like neutrophils. So neutrophils only enter into our tissues under what situation? Inflammation, 
right? So one of the major outcomes of complement activation is inflammation. Except in this case, in your blood vessels, because someone gave you blood, do you want inflammation happening? No. no. This is why we call it a hypersensitivity. Okay. So you activate common, one, you could get inflammation. You could get C3B binding, which doesn't happen because these are human cells. They're not bacterial cells. But the other thing that can form is the MAC complex. You remember that? Mm -hmm the membrane attack complex, which can insert into membranes. Do our cells have membranes? Yeah, so this happens, right? So the antibodies bind, activate, complement, we get inflammation, we get lysis of those cells. Oh boy. That's what happened. We're destroying those cells they just gave you. But they didn't just give it to you just to give it to you, did they? You needed them. <laughs> but now your immune system's going, uh-uh, no, you're not mine. You're not mine. You must be destroyed. And they're doing just that. Now, another class of antibody can interact with, you guys remember what lymphocyte does antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity? So, cellular cytotoxicity. We're going to kill this cell, right? What lymphocyte, because there's an antibody, on our cells is it going to attack and kill he's a killer natural killer cells right natural killer cells are the ones that can do antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity do you guys remember what class of antibody he can interact with it's just one of them it can cross the placenta IgG right so IgG can activate complement, we can kill the cells that way, or it can interact with the natural killer cells and the natural killer cells will kill those antibody-coated red blood cells. So the two conditions that fall under this hypersensitivity are blood transfusions of the wrong type, obviously and hemolytic disease of the newborn because of that special ability of IgG, right? It can cross the placenta. So it can travel from mom to baby and attack baby's red blood cells. So we'll just stick to just one class of antigens, the most common one, and that's the ABO blood group. So if someone tells you they have A-type blood, it means that on the surface of their red blood cells, is the antigen that we denote as the A antigen in this group of antigens, right? This is the ABO blood group. There's other groups of antigens we have out there. These are the most common, right? So your actual blood type could be a much longer than just A, B, um, O, or A, B, right? And then we also say plus and negative, right? That's a whole different antigen. That's the RH antigen. It's completely separate from this group of antigens. And that's the one we worry about with hemolytic disease of the newborn. When we say you're positive, it means you have that antigen. When you're negative, you don't have it, and that's where we have problems, right? So for the ABO blood group, right, and O means you don't have A or B. You don't have either one of those antigens in this group, right? So the blood center will keep calling you. They will keep sending you things in the mail and beg you to donate blood because that's what they commonly refer to as the universal donor because you can give it to just about anybody because no antigen, no antibodies attaching to your red blood cells, right? So we can, we can give your O to just about everyone, right? And especially if you're O negative, which means you don't have the RH antigen either, right? You're very popular. So this is important why we cross match and as far as the ABO blood group, IgM is the antibody you make. And this is the one where it's kind of tricky, right? Because why is it that uh, the first time someone gets a blood transfusion of the wrong type in the ABO group, they have a reaction? You have to have what to have a reaction? Antibodies. What has to happen in your body in order to produce antibodies? You've got to be exposed first to that antigen, don't you? right? First exposure, right? And you're going to get those B cells activated and memory cells and you're going to get that antibody, right? 
that takes seven to 14 days, right, to make that antibody. So the first time they give you blood, there's no way you should already have antibodies, right? This is the tricky one with this one. Is it with the ABO blood group? There are other antigens out there uh, found on bacteria that we're commonly exposed to that are very close to our ABO blood antigens. So naturally, you usually produce these antibodies that also are able to bind to red blood cells of the type you don't have. The good news is that if you have the B antigen, are you going to make antibodies against the B antigen? No, your body has shut that down, right? So even if that bacteria has something similar to the B antigen, it's not going to make that antibody. It'll make some other antibody against some other part of that bacteria. Make sense? Maybe so, kind of, sort of, okay. So naturally over time, we build up these antibodies against the antigen class you don't have. Right? So in my case, I'm O. So I probably have anti-A and anti-B antibodies of the class IgM in my body. So if you give me A or B or, oh my God, God forbid, both A and B blood type, where they have both antigens on their red blood cells, it's not going to be pretty for me. Right? Complement will probably be activated right in my blood vessels, right? Killing off those, those red blood cells you just gave me. Um, natural killer cells are not going to get involved because what class of antibody do they need? IgG. And what I say we produce against this blood group, IgM. And this is why you don't have to worry about matching this with your baby. Because remember, IgMs don't cross the placenta. They're too big, right? That big pentamer, they don't cross the placenta. So you don't have to worry about what antibodies you have against this crossing the placenta and hurting your baby. That's for the ABO blood group. RH is a whole different story. So remember the Nobel Prize website that we went to before for um, the, our introduction to immunology? I highly recommend, like if you're in A&P, going back to this later, they have a great blood typing game. We're not going to go over that kind of stuff, right? We're just talking about the antigens in this type of response. And this is some information from your book. Um, again, you're genetically determined by your parents, and this is right down to your blood group too, what antigen you have on the surface of your red blood cells. So at one time they could do to a certain extent, um, they could use blood typing to determine paternity, but nowadays we just do DNA testing, which is more accurate. Um, and, and this isn't a fail safe because there are certain combinations you could have any combination of kit, right? Um, but for instance, I'm O blood type and my husband is well, my baby's daddy <laughs> is B, right? Um, so my son is probably O or B. There's no way he's A, right? Because neither one of us had the A antigen. We couldn't have given it to my son, right? If he's A, then, you know, somebody's not telling the truth, <laughs> right? You see? <laughs> you see what I mean? Okay. All right. Um, so this is the common distribution among the different races, right? So as you can see, A is very common in um, uh, whites. Asians um, as well are actually mostly O. O is mostly, um, is the most common. Um, and then it's kind of split between the A's. A, B is very rare, as you can see, for, for most um, races. And again, our, our race is determined by our genetics, who our parents are, right? And uh, pretty soon, we'll probably all just be one race, right? <laughs> um, so hemolytic disease of the newborn. The only moms that have to worry about this is RH negative moms, right? Because if you're RH positive, are you going to make antibodies against yourself? No. Right? That would be autoimmune disease. Right? So unless you're experiencing autoimmune disease, you're not going to make antibodies against yourself. So if you're plus, never going to have this problem. Right? If you actually have that antigen, right? we say you have the plus blood type. If you are RH negative, and we discovered this in rhesus monkeys, that's where the RH comes from. Right? If you are negative, and for this antigen, you're, there aren't other bacteria and stuff out there that are similar to this antigen, 
The only way you produce this antibody is if you're exposed, right? So the normal process we're used to, right? You gotta be exposed to positive blood, right? Your B cells become activated, you produce IgG antibodies only, just IgG. But this is the problem with this one, it crosses the placenta, okay? So if you're a negative mom, how could you get exposed to positive blood? There's two ways, well, a couple of ways, but two major ways. How could you be exposed to positive blood? So one of the first things they'll ask you is you ever had a blood transfusion or surgery, right? Because during those, they give you blood usually, right? So that's one way someone could have screwed up and gave you positive blood, right? You wouldn't necessarily have a reaction the first time, but you'd produce those antibodies, wouldn't you? The other is if you've given birth to a positive child under conditions where the, you were not given the drug Rogan. The drug Rogam is actually an antibody against positive blood. So if, when the placenta detaches from the uterus, blood mixing between the baby and you could happen, right? So the baby's blood gets into your bloodstream and you could mount a response. So to stop you from doing that, they give you antibodies that you didn't produce against the baby's positive red blood cells and your immune system clears them hopefully without making any antibodies yourself or any memory cells, okay? Do they give you that during the delivery? Yeah. Uh, after. after, is it after? I think it's after, yeah, yeah, they give it to you after. Uh, and then if, if you've been a, there's other, I don't know if it's Rogam too, if you're a negative mom, I need to talk to Dr. LeBlanc because he's got three kids and his wife is negative and she had all kinds of complications because she had been exposed to positive blood. Um, and so she, even throughout her pregnancies, like especially the last one, she had to get treatment um, because of that RH um, problem. So um, I don't know the specifics of it, so don't quote me on it. <laughs> and they don't go into it in your book either. So do we need to know it for this class? No, but for your own knowledge, you may want to look it up. Um, so the complication here too is that like if you have a miscarriage, depending on what level, if, a, if the baby was positive, you could have mixing of the blood. If you have any trauma to the placenta during pregnancy, you could have mixing of blood um, where you would produce. Um, so one of the first things that when you're pregnant, they, they come at you with the whole stack of tubes, right? When you go for your first prenatal <laughs> visit and you go to get blood taken, they test for everything. Even if they know your blood type already, I swear they'll test it again. Um, and they test for sexually transmitted diseases, whether you know it or not. They do it for everybody because you could pass it on to the child, right? Um, they test for um, your antibodies to um, certain diseases um, that could cause um, birth defects like uh, chicken pox and um, rubella, and which is German measles, and then what's the other one? Regular measles, I think measles, mumps, not mumps, mumps doesn't cause problems with pregnancy, it's, it's rubella and measles, the two, uh, the two um, measles, German measles and regular measles. Okay. Because we get vaccinated against those diseases and um, so you should have um, antibodies in your system that could, they could know if you were vaccinated and if it was successful. Um, so that way, you, 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 um, if you get the infection, it's less likely that your baby's going to get sick because your immune system will take care of it before it would even get to the baby because you already have immunity to it due to vaccination. So the problem here is that if you're an RH negative mom and you've been exposed to positive blood, whether, whether it be you know a miscarriage, birth of a positive baby, trauma during um, your first pregnancy, right, or a blood transfusion of the wrong kind. The good news for guys, nothing to worry about, right? Yeah. Thus, I checked, they don't have babies. <laughs> right? <laughs> but they're the contributors of the positive gene. That's how the baby became positive. Right? So it's really the second pregnancy, right, that you'll have difficulties sometimes. But the first, if the mom is negative and has been exposed to positive blood, right? So that's not a be-all, end-all. And the problem is mom has produced these antibodies of what class, Ig. louder G. G and what's unique about this is they can go from mom to baby right and then when in baby attached to baby's red blood cells and then what's gonna happen 
you can activate complement, right? And the MAC complex and inflammation, and we lyse these red blood cells, and the natural killer cells can kill these cells, right? So hemolytic referring to destruction of the red blood cells, all right? So we understand the process, right? In this case, you've got to be exposed to produce these antibodies somehow to positive blood, right? And again, it's not going to be an immediate thing. It has to be a prior thing, right? Exposure prior, produce these antibodies prior, right? And then the baby could be harmed. That's it for type 2. Told you we're only get through the hypersensitivities. Type 3 involves immune complexes. What are immune complexes? What do antibodies bind to? Antigens, right? So we're talking about antigens bound to antibodies. That's it. That's what an immune complex is. Antigen and antibody. Where do these immune complexes tend to deposit? And this is when they're not being cleared fast enough and we have collect collections of antigen and antibodies not being gobbled up by the phagocytic cells. So again, in order to make antibodies, right, you have to be exposed to an antigen, right, produce the antibodies, and then the next time you're exposed, you get these antigen antibody complexes forming. The problem with this is that sometimes if you have too many intermediate sized ones like this could stay in the blood vessels. They can activate good old complement, right? And we have what happening inside our blood vessel? Inflammation, right? And deterioration of that blood vessel. <coughs> the other thing that can happen is they can attach inside, right? And again, activate complement um, and neutrophils and inflammation and destruction of the blood vessels. So there's several ways, but it all leads to the fact that these guys are not being gobbled up and eliminated by the phagocytes. Instead, they're activating inflammation in our blood vessels, right? So places where these tend to deposit is in our skin, in your joints, and really bad news in your kidneys, and then of course in small blood vessels themselves. That's what disseminated intervascular coagulation refers to when they're attaching inside those blood vessels. Same thing in the kidneys, it's those specialized blood vessels that filter your blood is where it's happening, right? So related to that one, I just have one question here, I don't have a slide for it. Uh, what does serum sickness mean? What happens with serum sickness? So one of the best examples I love is the crazy snake people because um, snake venom, right, you can make antibodies against it. Um, and especially horses are really good. Um, they can get bitten by a snake and they won't die. And they'll produce antibodies against the venom, okay? Unlike us, it'll probably kill us, right? In the time it would take our body to produce antibodies, forget it, you're toast. But what we can do is take those antibodies from the horse and give it to somebody. And those antibodies are in the horse's liquid phase of their blood called the serum. And this is when the blood is allowed to clot, and then we take that liquid phase. That's called serum, right? So anti-sera, serum, right, or antitoxins, right? These usually refer to the fact that you're dealing with an antibody, okay? And it's specific against the specific venom of the snake you got bit by, which is why they want to know what snake bit you, okay? Because the different snakes have different venoms, okay? So that's step one. They give it to you right, and save your butt if they give you the right one in the right amount of time because those antibodies from the horse are going to are gonna form those complexes and they're going to eliminate it, okay? The problem is, is if you're stupid enough to go get bit by a snake again, can they give you that same anti-serum? No, because were those your antibodies? No, they were foreign antibodies. But the first time it was close enough, your body was like, oh, okay, no problem. Right? But then some of those antibodies from the horse stayed around, didn't get used, and your body looked at it and went, wait a minute, that's not mine. I better make an antibody against it in case I see it again. That's bad news, though, because if you see it again, you have antibodies against that horse 
antiserum, right? And you get a serum reaction. This also can happen for some people with the tetanus vaccine, right? If you already have enough antibodies and they give you the vaccine again, you have the antigen in the vaccine and the antibody in your system already. And so then you're gonna have a whole bunch of these immune complexes forming and some of them are gonna stay around, right? And create problems because you just have too much. You could actually have too much. And in this case, it would be too much for the body. <laughs> we don't have enough time for type four. We'll do it next time. Along with the rest of the stuff. And then that's it. That's all she wrote. <laughs>